Hello, welcome to today's Noon Bite. The title for today's presentation is Supporting Deaf and Hard of Hearing Students in the Mainstream Setting. I am Diane Beard and I am an outreach teacher for, of the Deaf and Hard of Hearing students at the Colorado School for Deaf and Blind. Welcome. Okay, today's overview, we're going to cover several things. We're going to talk about team approach and working with, within the mainstream setting, the impact of hearing loss and helping team members understand, accommodations and modifications for students, and self-advocacy skills and understanding communication breakdown, and then we'll go over some resources that I've found. Okay, first thing I would like to talk about is team approach. With deaf and hard of hearing students in the mainstream setting, it really takes a team to help um, the students to be successful. And the team, of course, would consist of the parents, the classroom teacher, the teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing who's working with them. Often they are itinerant or you could have a center-based program. Um, if the student is deaf and is using sign language, they would have an interpreter. Some have speech language therapists. The uh, special education teacher is in, often involved, educational audiologist, and then also the principal is a very helpful person on that team. And within the team approach, what we want to look at is um, communication between those members. And that can be very difficult, especially when the uh, teacher of the deaf and hard of hearing is itinerant and going from building to building. So you want to look at some different strategies to help address the uh, team issues. So one could be a notebook system, especially for younger students. And then the different members could be writing in that notebook that can go home um, the parents of the younger students really enjoy that. Another idea is to be emailing to the different members on the team, uh, staying abreast of what's going on with the student. Often as an itinerant person, when I'm going from building to building, I try to have just a five minute meeting when I can and meet with the classroom teacher, see if there's any you know, uh, important issues going on with the student and kind of catch up with them. Um, also with the audiologist, we'll email back and forth different issues that are coming up with their hearing aids or FM systems, things like that. And then occasionally you'll want to have maybe a little bit longer debriefing meeting. I, um, the building I end up at the end of the day, I try and stay maybe 15 minutes, 20 minutes and catch up with the special ed teacher sometimes, the classroom teacher, whoever is there and, and wants to share some information on the student. And then you always want to be uh, aware of how they're progressing. So continually monitoring the student and sharing that information with everyone. Mm -hmm. So a, a big part of my job when I'm traveling uh, itinerantly to different schools is really helping the team members understand the impact of hearing loss. So what I have here is a picture of the uh, speech banana within the audiogram. And on the sides, it shows you the different uh, degrees of hearing loss, where it falls for mild, uh, moderate, severe, profound. And I bring this often to IEP meetings uh, or initial meetings with um, teachers, because sometimes maybe a classroom teacher, this is her, the, her first, his or her first experience with having a deaf or hard of hearing student in her class, so she doesn't understand what a severe hearing loss is. So bringing the, uh, this audiogram helps them understand why some speech sounds are difficult for them to hear. So this has been a very useful tool. And then other things we talk about when we're looking at the impact of hearing loss within the classroom setting, we will look at uh, what kind of frequencies can this student hear or not hear. Can they hear the low frequencies but not the high frequencies? So what does that look like on that audiogram and so what kind of speech sounds would they be missing? Also does the student consistently wear their hearing? amplification. Are they always wearing their hearing aids? Do they have a cochlear implant always wearing it? 
Are they new to just getting a cochlear implant? I had a student just a couple weeks ago who brand new um, to getting a cochlear implant. He's in middle school. So we just had a meeting just yesterday talking about, you know, what, um, how we are going to address this with the student. So all those things we want to stay on top of and discussing with the entire team. And then, uh, you know, have they had training in using this amplification? So, of course, with this new, the student getting the new cochlear implant, we're talking about what kind of training will he need to uh, learn to listen to all these new sounds, because it will sound different for him now that he has the cochlear implant. Okay, another thing I talk about with the team is the effect of room acoustics, because that's really important, especially for the hard of hearing students. Um, we talk about how that impacts the student's hearing. Because often um, team members think that, oh, when I talk with the student one-on-one, -on -one, they hear me just fine. But when you're within the classroom, it really changes because there's different um, aspects that will impact it, such as does the room have carpeting? Because hearing the movement of chairs on a hard floor versus carpeting is a major difference in causing background noise. If there's curtains within the room, all of that will lessen the rever reverberation of the noise and less echo means you'll be able to hear the speech sounds much clearer. And background noise is affected uh, greatly when you have lots of classroom discussions and of course you want to have classroom discussions but we want all the members to be aware how that will impact the hard of hearing student in listening because when there's several groups that are talking in a classroom it can be very hard then for the hard of hearing student to hear everyone clearly or if the teacher wants to start talking while those groups are meeting that's difficult for the hard of hearing student to understand uh, speech. Also, um, to be aware of uh, the different sounds within a classroom from an overhead projector, an air conditioning unit. Often I've gone into a classroom where there's a, an air conditioning unit when school is real, when the weather is really hot and the rooms are, are very hot. So to make sure to avoid sitting near there or to even talk about can we turn that off at different times when the teacher is doing some lecturing or specific instruction because it's really hard to hear over those loud noises that sometimes we have in our classroom and that it can be even sometimes from computers things of that nature so just making team members aware of all that is great um, also sometimes just simply closing the door in a to a classroom when that student is in your classroom because it will lessen that hallway noise that uh, can be disruptive to the student and missing some um, speech sounds and conversations that are happening. So just simply closing the door and even giving that responsibility to the deaf or hard of hearing student to do that. This uh, is a, a picture of an IEP uh, accommodations and modifications form that is found on the Colorado Department of Ed Education website. And I have found this very useful. It's in the Colorado Resource Guide um, that was developed by uh, CDE and Hands and Voices together. And I bring this to all of my IEPs that I go with students and it has a great uh, outline for different accommodations and modifications that are very appropriate for deaf and hard of hearing students within the mainstream setting. So definitely check out this form because it's very useful. Now I'm going to talk about some of the accommodations that are found on this form um, to, to talk about and a lot of these things I either talk about early when the student is just starting school or definitely again we talk about it in the IEP process so we we bring it up um, multiple times during the year to make sure all team members are aware of, of these accommodations for the students so uh, one of course is preferential seating um, allowing the uh, student to be near the front and even off to one side so that they can have a better visual view of as many classmates as possible and the instructor in the room. 
Um, also, if the uh, instructor could limit pacing, because if the if the instructor paces to the back of the classroom, then there's no chance for the student to see the face of the instructor if they start talking from the back of the room. So trying to encourage um, the instructor to be near the front of the room in front of the deaf or hard of hearing student. Also, if you can seat in more of a horseshoe or circle shape, especially during group discussions, that is very helpful because that allows the deaf and hard of hearing students to see um, all of the participants in the group discussion and then can easily follow who's talking. Uh, another um, suggestion is to allow the uh, student to have the freedom to dis decide where will their interpreter, if they have used sign language, where their interpreter will stand or sit um, so that they have an ideal sight between the interpreter and the instructor or whatever else is being looked at. Are you using you know, an interactive whiteboard too and things? So they have to have a great um, line of sight for all of those things. So letting the student help decide where the interpreter can stand so there's a great view is, is wonderful. Also be aware of lighting and glare issues. If the instructor is standing in front of a window that can be very hard for the student then to see the facial expressions and, and uh, speech reading abilities, so to be aware of those things. Uh, some other communication accommodations are to make sure you get the student's attention prior to speaking or signing to them. So you want them looking at you before you start instructing. Uh, also allow them to see your face uh, when you are talking, like I just said in the previous um, part. Um, they need to see your face to get the, for facial expression, for speech reading, things of that nature. Give them extra clues in figuring out the information. Also speak at uh, clearly at a normal uh, pace. Uh, shouting won't help them hear any better, so just clearly at a normal pace is perfect. And um, when you change the subject, it's uh, great to let them know uh, when you are changing the subject rather than talking and then they have to figure out, now what does, how does that relate to what we were saying before? Let them know ahead, uh, right when you are going to change the subject or the context and that helps them follow the conversation better. All right, also, if the student asks you uh, what you just said because they missed it, just try saying the same thing using different words. Sometimes just a different word has different speech sounds that are better for them to hear and then they can understand and, and get it quicker. And um, also, if the student does not understand what you say, don't give up on them uh, easily and say, oh, it's not important or I'll tell you later. Really just uh, continue to try and say it in different ways for them to get it. Also um, want to think about respecting that turn-taking process to allow that equal communication access for the deaf and hard of hearing student um, because they have to follow um, who's talking and it's hard, especially when you're in a group, to know who's talking now, who's talking next. So if you can especially point out to them who's talking, if you have a class discussion, maybe they don't realize it's someone kind of slightly behind them to the right who is talking. So if you can point or even if you could name, oh, Johnny, would you like to add to that discussion? Then they know who's talking. That really helps them. Also, if you have handouts to give to the students, allow them time to look at the handout first prior to discussing, because they're looking down and they're not looking up at who's speaking. So give them a little bit of time to look at that. Also, if you have an interpreter in the room, if you could give them a copy, that helps greatly too. So just remember that trying to read and watch the interpreter or watch the instructor, it's simultaneously, it's just impossible. All right, now we're going to talk about some instructional accommodations. 
And what's very important are visual cues and visual supplements. They really help the um, hard of hearing and deaf students. So gestures you're using, facial expressions, pictures, charts, maps, vocabulary lists, um, overheads, lecture outlines, all of that is very, very helpful. And other types of visuals, it doesn't have to just be the academics that you're talking about, but you can have visuals, as I am showing here, a visual related to behavior or routines in the class, because then you can just easily refer to this. I use this often with um, elementary um, kids who are signers. I just point to it when they're um, kind of getting off task, then I can just point to it. It says, you know, um, when you finish your work, you can have computer time. So that way I can just refer to it and then they know that they need, oh, time to get back on task here. Some other instructional accommodations are always check for understanding of information and do that periodically during your lesson because um, often within um, a busy classroom, if there's uh, multiple things going on, group discussion going on, uh, students who are deaf and hard of hearing could miss some information and not even realize that they miss it. So make sure you check um, for understanding. And also you could work out a system where you and the student can have a signal where they can signal you, do something, you know, something uh, and it's kind of confidential between you and the student. Maybe they do something with two fingers tapping their cheek. It can be anything you set up. Then that's a clue and it empowers the student to let you know, hmm, I don't understand that. And just kind of uh, nonchalantly let you know, could you, you know, go over that again for them. Also, if you have predictability within your environment and routines, that really helps them because they know, okay, once we're done with my math work, I need to put it at the corner of my desk and you're going to come by and check it. So when they know those routines, they can, it helps them easily follow within the structure of the classroom. And also, you know, to think about, it's very tiring to have to listen so hard all day or to watch a signer all day. So give them some time where they have a little bit of downtime, breaks from all the listening and watching. It's very helpful. Some other instructional accommodations um, that, would, that are helpful to deaf, hard of hearing students are if you have interactive whiteboards and you're to uh, show what you're talking about that is uh, wonderful because they can see what you're talking about and see you all at the same time. Also a uh, great idea is to have videos and TV programs that are captioned and there is also um, the dcmp.org website which allows you to stream videos for free. You can set up a free account and get captioned videos on all sorts of subjects for school, so it's a great, great resource. Also to have a buddy system for that deaf and hard of hearing student. So they can have someone who is maybe taking notes for them because it's so hard to look down writing notes, then they're missing watching the instructor, what they're saying. So if they could have a note or a buddy taking some notes and also maybe a buddy who just kind of helps assist them making sure they follow along Maybe they were busy writing something and missed when you said turn to page 97 and this buddy can make sure, oh, don't forget, turn to page 97, just kind of that checks and balances for them. So that helps many students. Also pre-teaching vocabulary and concepts before you actually get into the lesson is great rather than um, them trying to figure out what word did they say, I don't understand that word. So if you can really emphasize it, pre-teach it beforehand, then when you're teaching your lesson, then they're aware of the new vocabulary and concepts. And also to really teach some of those cognitive or language strategies that help them understand text. So definitely talking about prediction and uh, compare and contrast, inferencing, those specific skills will really help them. 
All right, I've also provided some educational resources um, here, some things that I have been using over for a number of years and, and recently some new things I have found. One of the um, software um, pieces that I use is uh, Clicker 6 and I have the website there uh, for you to go to. It's a great reading and writing tool and has lots of great picture support uh, and I've used it with a variety of ages. Um, it definitely looks more geared towards elementary but I have used it with some older um, and they also have uh, Write Online, which is more geared for middle school and high school at that same um, website. So check it out. Those are great um, reading and writing supporting tools for those students. Also, if you're looking for some um, skill, uh, skill sheets to work on auditory uh, discrimination and auditory training, those kinds of things, uh, I've found the book called Multiple Auditory Skills Super Pack has great activities to work on some of that, those skills. And the website is there, greatideasforteaching.com, super place to get lots. And there's a variety of things there, lots of language things, because our deaf and hard of hearing kids often need some language work too, so there's great language things there. And then the last one listed there, um, uh, it's super duper publications and I found they have some great um, things they called fun decks, they're card decks with various language skills, inferencing, sequencing, sorts of, all sorts of things, games, stories that you can use with them. So great resource, so check it out. I know uh, a lot of you are also using um, iPads or tablets in the classroom. So I have some, uh, I have an iPad that I take with me. So these are some of the educational apps that I use with some of the students. There's one called Bits Board. What I like about this one, it has a variety of ways. Um, for example, one, one of the uh, programs I use on it is for feelings and emotion words. And then you can have all these different games. It can be a true-false type game. It can be a matching of the picture to the word, uh, all related to that same theme. So I, I use that one quite often. Book Creator is a great app. You can download um, any kind of pictures. So you can do pictures of the, your students, things happening in your class, upload them to your um, iPad, and then the students create a book out of that. So that's helpful. Or you could you know, use pictures related to whatever theme you're teaching. And then they could create a book and do some reading and writing with it. With some of the older students, uh, I use Phrasal Verbs Machine. And that's a great one because kids uh, often um, have lots of language gaps. So we talk about how these verbs can change when you put a different uh, prepositional word with it and now it changes the meaning completely. And it has a demonstration, has these cute little cartoons where we're demonstrating the meaning of it. And then I have the kids write their own sentence using that verb phrase in it. So the older kids, middle school and high school, really enjoy that one. They don't realize they're, they're doing some learning <laughs> with that one. For the um, deaf students who are signers, I've used um, Signed Stories, that app. It has a variety of stories that are already signed on it that you can uh, purchase. They're um, just a minimal cost, they're not too expensive. And then the other one, Auditory Processing Studio, is just a brand new one that, that I just discovered where you can do some auditory discrimination and. Uh, auditory processing skill work on that one. And another big part of working with uh, deaf and hard of hearing students within the mainstream setting is helping them to develop self-advocacy skills. So you really want to promote that with the students so that they can um, uh, really feel included within the, the room and guiding their own uh, decisions. Also, you, uh, they may need some direct instruction on how to interact uh, appropriately and socially with their hearing peers within the classroom. Uh, also look at helping the student understand their own hearing loss and how it uh, affects their education. And uh, then often I have the kids explain it to their classmates and it's a great learning pr 
um, process for them. Another thing is to have them, you know, interact and meet other deaf and hard of hearing peers their own age and also adults. So there's a variety of ways they can do that. You can do uh, pen pal programs. There's, um, you could do video conferencing and connect with others at another school. Um, at CSDB, we offer a literacy morning event where kids can connect in from far away to the students here and have that chance to connect and meet. So think of those, and there's community events with uh, deaf and hard of hearing people. So think of some of those events to get the students to and let the families know about them. Other things related to self-advocacy skills is helping the student um, learn and to practice how they can do communication repair so they didn't understand what someone said. How can we help that situation so that we can understand what was said by the other person? Or maybe they didn't understand me, the student. So how, what can we do so that the others can understand us? So you can work on the different ways for communication repair, which are repetition, revision, addition, or nonverbal cues. So working on those different um, strategies and teaching the kids those strategies and then they practice them. And there's a variety of programs that are ready made that you can get um, to help the students with that. Uh, also there are games that you can use with the students where they can describe different strategies that they would use to in this very difficult um, and challenging listening environment. Uh, and also there are games that you can now identify where is this listening challenge coming from? Is it coming from the speaker who is speaking to the student? Is it the listener themselves, the student? Or is it due to things that are going on in the environment that is causing the communication breakdown? So teaching these skills really helps the students understand the communication repair. And now I have some um, games and I'm going to show you some. I found them on this great website. It's Supporting Success for Kids with Hearing Loss. And the website is right there. It, it's a, just a wealth of information. They have lots of information for parents, for uh, professionals, and then they have some, lots of products that you can purchase. And so like I just said earlier, that you could do some games to practice some of those skills. I have those shown right here and they're on that website. Um, they're not very expensive, so you could order them and use them with the students. And I'll show you some of them. Here is one game. It's called What's the Problem? And with it we have uh, cards and they have situations of uh, difficult listening situations that can happen within a classroom, in a social setting, at home. And so the students would draw one of the cards, they would read it, and then they have to decide, is the problem with this uh, listener, the student, is the problem due to the environment, and they would put it there, or is the problem due to the um, speaker, the teacher, or whoever is speaking? then they have to match uh, a resolution to that. How could we fix that communication situation? And so it, it leads to lots of great discussion. I usually limit how many we do each time and have a good discussion on how to help them learn, develop skills for that to do on their own. Another game, this one is called Hear It, Fix It. And this one I use quite often kind of more to build those communication repair strategies. So you can make it as simple and as complex as you want by drawing cards and telling the kids where they are going to sit, uh, put those cards on this board here. And then they can also be the person who gives the instructions. So it gives you great practice in, in practicing those communication repair strategies. That is one. Another one that I've just started using with the kids is a wizard's challenge. And this one is kind of neat because it compares being a hard of hearing student, 
or a deaf student in a mainstream setting when you're maybe only one or two in your class with Harry Potter and how Harry Potter was unique in going to his school. So the kids have been enjoying this. I've done this with middle school kids. And then another one that's listed there. This one is called Money Talk. And this is a great game, just like What's the Problem that I showed earlier, where it has difficult um, listening situations. You draw, draw the card, you discuss it, how would you, we do the communication repair. But what's also nice about this, it also has multiple meaning words in it. And so you can talk about that and idioms. So bring the, those up also, because those can be tough for deaf and hard of hearing kids. So check out this website. You'll find lots of great resources there. And another great resource that is on this very same website um, is a great self-advocacy um, booklet. It's a free ebook, completely free. It's been um, developed by Christina English at the University of Akron, and she has very generously shared it with everyone freely on this website. And it has 12 different lessons, and I'm using it with the high school students that I'm working with. And it really helps them um, realize you know, how they can self-advocate for themselves. You talk about the IEP, different rights, responsibilities while you're in high school. Then what about after high school? What kind of rights do you have afterwards in work settings, things like that? So this is a very nice free resource for anyone to use. So check it out. And here are the references for um, the Colorado Department of Education website where I found the um, IEP accommodation form and then where I took some of the information for this um, presentation today. So thanks for joining us today. Hope you got some new resources and some great information to share with your team at your school. Thanks.